His third wife died in bed after a night of heavy drinking. Buy the ticket, take the ride. Faithful servant and friend of Christ. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Beth and Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. How's it going? Great to see you as always. For those of you who are new, this show is to help you find the greatest books you've ever read. Get that coffee. Not very hot today. So today is Tom Christensen's Havoc. Look at that cover. That is a beautiful beautiful mess, which is what this book is. It's a complete and total beautiful mess. I'm partially sponsored by NYRB. They send me books sometimes, but this was a gift from uh, Jesper, a book-loving Dane in Florida who goes by Cover Talks on Instagram. Thank you very much, Jesper. I really appreciate it. Love this. Karl of Knausgaard, the Norwegian author of My Struggle, told his friend on page 480 of My Struggle Volume 2 that this was the scariest book he'd ever read. This is about a man who becomes disenchanted with normal bourgeois Copenhagen family life to the point where he wants to forget it all. He wants to burn it all down. Ole Jastrow is a mid-30s book reviewer at a prestigious paper in Copenhagen called Dog Blot It. I imagine him looking like Stellan Skarsgård in his mid-30s. Of course, he was Swedish, but... He has a stern, responsible wife and young son. They all seem to get along okay. I think he's kind of annoyed by his kid, who's just sort of that age. Well, I mean, but he's that age where he is annoying. I mean, it's not, it's not like there's this like animosity or anything, but um, or maybe there is. It doesn't really get to the heart of things, but it is interesting. It's kind of ambiguous. We find him in the beginning trying to write these book reviews in his apartment, and things are starting to build up. Little tensions in his life are revealed. One fine day, there's a knock at the door, and who could it be but Bernard Sanders and Stefan Stefansson? Sanders is a communist, a ghost from Ole's past, and the other is more of a dissolute poet who respected Ole Jastrow, but is now disappointed to see someone who he thought was a rebel, as Jastrow used to write communist poetry, in a position of normal bourgeois mediocrity. Sanders and Stefansson are on the run for printing obscenities or something, but there's an election the following day, and if a certain party is elected, then they'll be forgiven and off the hook. So for 24 hours, they're essentially on the run, and they decide to crash at Ole's place. Tensions are high during this visit. The guests are exceptionally rude. It's almost like a Michael Haneke or Lars von Trier drama where like everything is heightened. Cracks in Ole's marriage are revealed, and at first disgusted with his guests, eventually uh, Ole's wife is charmed by Sanders, to the point where Ole notices her behaving in a way she hasn't with him in a very, very long time, it seems. Stephenson, gruff, quiet, rude, but a good poet apparently, drinks. And Jastra begins to bond with him through this activity. As we discover, Jastra certainly drinks as well. And throughout the book, he drinks more and more and more. Even after these two leave, Stephenson keeps appearing in his life. This person who represents the former rebellion that Jastra has lost. And that manifests itself in getting absolutely rip-roaringly fucked up with all sorts of characters at the Bar des Artistes. A hotel bar where there's always music and cocktails being shaken by a cheery bartender named Lundbaum. Who am I picturing an adaptation being played by someone like Richard Griffiths? Of course he was English, but rest in peace, Uncle Monty. Skull. Jastrow's visits become more and more frequent. His work begins to suffer, but they don't seem to fire him. This goes on for quite some time, like over a year, I think. He visits a prostitute and his wife eventually leaves him after he keeps coming home drunk and she takes his son with her. He suspects she's had an affair as well, but we can't be sure. There are several big plot points that are not answered in Havoc, and that's interesting. I find that fascinating. The big finale, for example, maybe the most important whodunit moment in the book is never revealed, and that's compelling. That seems ahead of its time. Um, nothing is wrapped up, nothing, nothing is solved, nothing is, is, is settled. And I'll, I'll spoil it a little bit. He doesn't die, you know, because a lot of books are, I seem to have been reviewing lately, it's like the character dies or they commit suicide or something. But this, that doesn't happen, although that's basically his intention. This man's intention is to essentially kill himself through drinking. His, his intention is to completely destroy his life and himself in an effort to be free. It's like be free or die trying by drinking. But he doesn't die, and, and that's kind of a, the, the twist of fate. And fate plays a large role in Havoc. Jastrow's fate is Havoc. 
He tries to avoid it, he tries to put on the mask and play the role, basically, but he can't be free. And it gnaws at him, it eats him away. No one is free to act or think the way they like. Not entirely. You have some freedoms, but you can't do whatever you want. A person can think whatever he wants to about aesthetics, ethics, and I don't know what else. But if he has opinions that encroach on economics, then the freedom no longer applies, he tells somebody in the book. You're free as long as you play the game that money is God. The cash giveth and the cash taketh away. It is all powerful and it works in mysterious ways. Fate brings him back to self-destruction, to havoc, to freedom through self-destruction. Does that make sense? He wants to drink himself to death. He wants to go to the dogs, as he puts it, from one trap to another, body to body, job to job, heartache to heartache, drink to drink. Jastrow tells his friend's wife that he's turned out to be a simple, ordinary man who has made a slight attempt to plumb the depths of the soul and find the meaning of absolute freedom. And for now, I've managed to become a drunkard, he says. It's not just authenticity or his youth that Jastrow seeks to return to. It's deeper, truth, freedom, infinitude, the sublime, the incommunicable, the place religion accesses. Something that transcends the day-to-day -day drudgery and tedium of a respectable existence, with all of its fundamentally unimportant headaches and anxieties. Drinking allows him to forget and access a deeper space. But does it really? That's sort of the question. It's a lie. As far as the writing itself, it's really beautiful. Christensen describes vividly uh, Jastrow's Copenhagen. In depth, the streets, the colors, the sounds, the music, the people. It sounds like what people say Ulysses reads like. I haven't actually read it. But ironically, it's referenced in this book, so I wonder if uh, um, Christensen was taking notes from Joyce. Copenhagen is mapped out through Jastrow's disintegration. Here's his apartment, here's his bar he drinks at, here's the jail he's thrown in. But of course we ask, where is all this going? What does Jastrow really want? Well, it's tough to put into words. There is something I want, and when I drink I sometimes feel for a moment that I've captured it. Liquor is the only substitute for religion. Shall we put it that way? Just for fun? Alcohol is an astoundingly powerful force. It really has so much potential for connection and destruction inside it. It's no wonder it's so popular and so dangerous. If one thinks they can handle it, then they're likely wrong. Alcohol doesn't work like that. You can't trust it. It's something to be feared and respected. He and Stephenson, they even try to convert to Catholicism as a way of structuring their lives, as a method of saving themselves, religiously and literally. But the priest is asleep and won't see them. God's house, the Catholic Church, is closed at night. But in his Gospel of Bitterness, as Jastrow puts it, Come on, Stephenson, I know a bar that's never closed. The bar won't close its door to them at night. It will welcome them with open arms. Jastrow's religious conversion fails. Stephenson, as it turns out in the end, at least it's assumed, does convert. Jastrow wants freedom. He wants to lose all the things he's built up, which give him nothing but tedious anxiety and depression. The feeling that he's living a lie, that he's not actively pursuing the important things. That is, infinity. The important thing doesn't seem able to be articulated through words. So Jastrow silently goes to the dogs. In the end, the writing starts to become hallucinatory, unreliable, but again, beautiful. But in this weird way, you start to feel good for him. You kind of want him to succeed in his downfall. Because he's stopped giving a fuck. He has really stopped giving a fuck. It's exhausting to live a life totally concerned with what other people think of you. In fact, that's something a lot of us seek to get rid of. He finally lets all of that fall away. He just does not care. <clears throat> Some days, I think a lot of us want to feel like that. He was invulnerable now. Everything that formerly had tormented him over at the paper, everything that could weaken or undermine his position, was nothing but a voice drowned out now and then by a rattling sound, a faint, faint voice in a wrecked telephone receiver. Nothing, nothing could hurt him anymore. I don't know if it's possible to be totally compassionate and not give a fuck about what other people think of you. Um, I don't know if that's a good way to live or not, but some days, it sure feels like it, no? Sometimes it seems as if you just have to say, fuck it. And sometimes, and sometimes we die. Sometimes we don't make it through those moments. Sometimes we don't come out the other end. Sometimes those moments kill us. Would my struggle have been published if Knausgaard was worried about what other people thought of him? <clears throat> nope. Christensen conveys the feeling of being drunk and disoriented, but soothed, charmed, and mesmerized 
by the pleasant, warm feelings of being completely sauced. And then the human proximity came on in waves, until it was like a sea, an element in which it was natural to embrace each other. Friendship. Oh, that precious feeling. Whiskey. Whiskey. Immerse yourself in whiskey, and have faith in your friends. Unlimited faith. At the same time, Christensen is able to convey the feeling of alcoholism, the nervous tension, the blackout moments, the odd image to image of a drunken existence with gaps in the narrative. How'd we get here, basically? The extreme emotions. 500 pages or so. It's a... Uh, not short. Not short. It'll take you a, a while. Probably a month. Maybe two. Christensen was a poet, a critic, a novelist, and a travel writer, who himself had many similarities to Jastrow. And the book seems partially autobiographical, or at least drawing from his own life. Write what you know, right? He also happens to look a lot like what I pictured Jastrow looking like. But the similarities are darker than him just being a poet, working at a leftist paper, etc., etc. Thirteen years after the publication of Havoc, in 1943, his third wife died in bed after a night of heavy drinking. Buy the ticket, take the ride. While this was published in 1930, you could totally see this happening today. But I may not have read it, so beautifully written is this. Uh, this is phenomenal. Better than food, for sure. There's also a Danish film adaptation in the 70s that I would like to see. Uh, it seems hard to find, though. Highly recommended if you enjoyed Under the Volcano by Malcolm Lowry or My Struggle by Karl Ove Knausgaard. And now, it is time for the Coffee Lottery. The Coffee Lottery, for those of you who are new, is where I take all the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video, I place their names in this mason jar, and I pull out a name for every review I do, and whoever's name I pull out, I send them a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee, roasted by yours truly. And if you'd like to get in on that, you can head over to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food, or down in the description box below, there should be a link. And I sincerely appreciate it. If you donate $1 or more per video, you will get access to all the patron-only reviews, Sometimes I post reviews early for patrons, and also the Better Than Friday newsletter, which I send out every Friday, which is just a list of five things that I'm interested in at any given time. Could be books, articles, YouTube videos, music, all sorts of things. Constantly changing. Anyways, thank you so much to the patrons for the support. You're making this all possible. Really appreciate it. Best of luck. Here we go. Chris J. Thanks a bunch, Chris. Really appreciate it. You're going to receive Havoc by Tom Christensen, plus some delicious coffee. Please hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this, please subscribe if you haven't already, and always remember to bring a book, wherever you go, even to the bar. But don't go to the bar too much. You won't find freedom there. You will go broke, though. If that's what you're looking to do, you can go broke very easily at a bar. Please drink responsibly, and if you need a good reminder, read this book. All right, take care of yourselves, have a great night, great to see you as always, have a good one, ciao.